for the wafting strains of the theme to Perry Mason, a long disappeared television lawyer. Our talkback lawyer, David Whiting, is here to help you with free legal advice. 1300 222 774. 1300 222 774 if you would like to ask David a legal question. David, good morning to you. Good morning, John. Does the law provide a definition of partner in a domestic relationship sense. Uh, there's a bit of argy-bargy in, you might have noticed in the federal parliament at the moment about whether someone's their, your partner or not because um, you might find you're in a relationship with them, they're pregnant, carrying your child, but according to the rules, the Prime Minister says that doesn't mean they're your partner. Uh, there, there is a definition within the Administration and Probate Act of what it is to be a domestic partner. In the probate act? Well, it, what happens is is that we give rights to people yeah. who are in a domestic relationship with a person who dies, so if they're not provided for in the will. So we needed to, at that stage, define what a domestic partner is. And what you're really doing is they, is they live together as a couple. Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, um, they share life together as a couple because right. there are cases that talk about domestic partners being in living in separate residences. So it's... Uh, and there's also a concept of partner or spouse that's used for immigration purposes. Right. And uh, that too talks about residence, but it also talks about the way you present to other people. It's um, a bit of a worry, that, isn't that it? It is possible to have a relationship with someone without them becoming without a partner. Without them being a partner. And the old term, I've got several text messages from people saying she was his mistress until she became his partner, but either way, it's not right. So, look, it is embarrassing that we're having this discussion about our, at the moment, Deputy Prime Minister and soon to be Acting Prime Minister. I find that all a bit awkward, but I'm not the only one, it would seem. Let's move on to other things as well. We've got a Royal Commission that got started yesterday. Former High Court Judge Ken Hain read the Riot Act to the assembled council for the various banks and told them missing deadlines was not acceptable, gave them a 24-hour extension. Did you notice that? Well, he did give them a month or two in which to prepare the paperwork. And yeah, the report... when they came along and said, we're not ready, and he said, fine, I'll give you till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that. Well, Commonwealth Bank came along and said, can't do it in 50 pages. Could we have 200, please? Yeah. And, uh, and his answer was, you can have 75 pages. Yeah. So it took a little over an hour, um, relatively small courtroom, and uh, there were overspill in the Fair Work Commission offices, which they were using, have you got to any, two more hearing rooms. you got any big litigation coming up? Because there's going to be a bit of a shortage of top barristers, isn't there? Uh, these guys have already been on it for quite some time. Yeah, yeah, John. but yeah. if you need someone senior for some heavy duty litigation, commercial litigation in Melbourne at the moment, they might well be engaged. They're already. all a bit. They're all a bit busy. So yeah. you might be getting the B team, who are the only ones around. Do you think the rest of the court should go and leave for a little while, John? Is that <laughs> no, your suggestion? I most certainly don't. In fact, no, it's not fair to call some of those people the B team. It may be the chance for other people to show how good they are, whilst yep. the acknowledged top heavy hitters are engaged by the banks and the royal Yeah, I think, look, I think that's right. There's an extraordinary amount of talent at the bar. So, Anyhow, um, no, I have no upcoming litigation that would uh, uh, require me to hire a senior counsel. That's good. And uh, Victoria's become Suppression City. It used to be South Australia, but some stats released yesterday show that we're now twice as likely to issue suppression orders as any other jurisdiction. What's going on? Uh, well, I think it's the, the fun is the inconsistency with the concept of an open court system when the government produced a piece of legislation in 2013 called the Open Courts Act, and it's to strengthen and promote the principles of open justice and free communication of information. There's a presumption in favour of the disclosure of information, and you'll recall that our next footballer was... Uh, uh, before the courts last week, and he sought a suppression order as to his identity because it would affect his employment, and uh, the magistrate found against him. But last year, there were 855 suppression orders ordered in, in Australia, and 443 of them, or 51.8% of them, in Victoria. So clearly, there are uh, increasing amounts of uh, justice that is not... Um, I mean... John, you and I have both wandered around the courts at various times and sat in on things. It's great fun. I highly recommend it to people. Well, it, you know, it, it sort of is, John, but there are short highlights 
and long periods of drudgery is my experience. Oh, you get up and walk out and go and look for something that's a better show in another room. Yeah, I, well, you do that, but um, this is a and, and I'm not. It's they're like not closing the courts. Park, it's like the entries, but they're not park. getting reported. Like like getting your ground pass at the tennis, you wander around and find what you want and sit down and watch it. Yeah, except you, yes. <laughs> Except some of the court, some of the courts are closed, John. So. Yeah, well, in fact, yes, you're not allowed in everywhere, and sometimes mm. people actively stop you. Other times they say you can come in, but you're not allowed to report if you're from the media. Yep. So yeah, every yeah. now and then you'll go and there'll be a sign on the door that says no, nope. closed court. Yep. Now two other things, John, if I might. Sure. Uh, every now and then we get questions that talk about uh, the assignment of bank credit debt and the enforcement of those. We had a caller a few weeks ago who hadn't heard of anybody from, from anyone for a long period of time. Uh, the matters had to be considered in the Supreme Court because in this particular case, the Commonwealth Bank had obtained a judgment in 2009, sold the debt, and the creditor wanted to enforce it. And the Limitation of Actions Act says that a judgment is good for 15 years. And so um, from a professional perspective, I've never had to answer the question, but I wondered at what stage could you simply go and issue another enforcement application rather than new proceedings? Uh, a, a case called CBA and Segesi, S-A-G-G-E-S-E, uh, d- discusses the issue and basically says if you're more than six years since you've got a judgment, you start again, but you sue on the judgment, right. not on the which, antecedent. Which makes it much quicker. Yeah, and there's also a discussion in the case about deals that were claimed to have been done between the creditor and the, the debtor and the bank. And finally, Peter from Mount Eliza and junk mail. Uh, there's no law in Australia that prevents junk mail being put in your letterbox. If you want to go to a, sorry, no law in Victoria. If you want a jurisdiction where that happens. You need to go to Queensland where they have the Waste Reduction and Recycling Act of 2011, which makes it an offence to put unsolicited mail, um, provided you say, I don't want unsolicited mail. So if you've got a no junk mail sticker, it's... it's, Yeah. Is there a penalty for breaching it? Oh, John, I lost interest in finally (laughs) having found the legislation. Australia Post says, put on a no junk mail or addressed mail only sticker and we won't put it in. Uh, and you, there, you can contact the Australian Catalogue Association and they will give you a sticker. It just gets you on another list, John. People take no note. The people who actually are walking around the streets sticking things in letterboxes take next to no notice. Well, at, the, at what they're paid for it, John, I yeah, quite understand care. that. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, to today's callers, Why not? Phil in Newcastle first up. At Newcastle, New South Wales, is it, Phil? Yeah, that's correct, guys. Good morning. How are you? Oh, well, welcome to Melbourne, ABC Melbourne. Thank you. A uh, former um, Melbourne resident. Um, look, the situation is we've got a, um, a house in Melbourne, my partner and I, um, which is um, rented and being managed by uh, an agent. Um, we've decided to sell that and we've called for appraisals and sales proposals from three agents. Yes. Uh, one of which is the managing agent. Yep. Um, through the managing agent, and those appraisals are starting to come in now. Yes. Uh, through the managing agent, we issued a notice to vacate sale of premises. Mm-hmm. To the tenant or in the process of it. Yes. Um, and the managing agent, I rightly called the tenant to um, discuss that with them. Yes. Uh, and I got an email back from the managing agent saying, um, we're doing what that'll go out in the post today, but the tenant's interested in purchase of the premises. Can you yes. give us a guide? So my questions are can I contact the tenant directly? to discuss that matter now and when would it be considered that I've actually entered into a, a contract with an agent for the sale of the premises? Okay. My assumption um, is I'd can... actually sign a formal agreement there, to sell the premises. There is a requirement under the Estate Agents Act that the engagement be in writing. So if you were... Sorry, there's no reason why you can't contact the tenant now. Right. Uh, no impediment for that contact at all. And you can reach an agreement as to price and you don't need to engage the agent in connection with that transaction. Um, If you're talking, you just simply need to make it clear in your communications with the agent that you are not engaging them in connection with the sale of the property until such time as you make a decision to adopt their proposal under under what you've requested from them. How do you know you're getting the right price if you don't use the services of a professional agent, Phil? Well, we have um, had a um, uh, evaluation about six or eight months ago. Was that a formal valuation for finance-type purposes or was it an appraisal from an agent? 
an appraisal, you know, they probably come and knocked on the door or put a leaflet in or something and said, you know, we have buyers in your area, yep. the usual sort of thing. But we do have proposals. But we don't have buyers if now. you're listed with somebody else. Yes, I've always found yes. that funny. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. But um, we had three agents go through last week, um, and um, the managing agent um, was aware of that and, and organised those um, sessions. In fact. Yep. So and, you're comfortable um, and with those the price you've set. Are coming. Oh well, we're, we're discussing a price. We've got a, a figure in our mind, okay. and uh, we'll do, I'm wondering whether I can discuss that directly. With you the can tenant. indeed. You do not need to engage an agent if you don't want to. All you need to be really satisfied is that the price is one you're prepared to agree to. All right. More and more people doing that actually, David, and saying, "Look, I don't really need." professional help anymore. I can advertise, I can market, and I can use the internet, and I can do it. And, and there are also lots of now flat fee agents rather yep. than agents seeking a percentage. All righty. Gavin in South Yarra, good morning to you. Good morning, John uh, and David. Quick one. Um, I was sitting at the traffic lights watching a cabbie on his mobile, uh, you know, maybe booking machine or whatever it is, uh, and uh, almost killed someone, and I've seen it before. Um, I'm just wondering, do cabs have an exemption no. from the law around mobile navigation devices? No, they don't. So they're all illegal? Uh, no, why are they illegal? I, th I thought that uh, you could have a mobile device and interact with it in your vehicle while it was moving, only if it was a navigational aid. But um, the cabbies are using... All, all sorts of different things. And uh, I see it quite often that they're distracted and driving and uh, just wonder well, if I they see, were I exempt. see most of them have got three or four devices these days. There's a phone, there's a private network, and there's the cab company, and there's you know, often something else. A mapping device of some kind. So uh, The uh, big units are mapping devices as well. But there's mostly. no exemption. They're supposed to only no use exemption. those things but, when they're pulled over and not, not yes. on, the, on the highway. Uh, it is possible to get an exemption. Um, once I read that there was a possibility of an exemption, I wrote and asked for one. And it was declined, me, Gavin, as it should have been. But, you know, there was <laughs> nothing to say I couldn't ask. Mm. Ah, there you go. All righty. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, Bob in Port Melbourne. Hello, Bob. Oh, hello, gentlemen. Uh, this uh, inquiry concerns my deceased mother's estate. Uh, died in June last year. Uh, firstly, um, when money is in a uh, solicitor's uh, account from the estate, is it uh, mandatory that the interest should be paid uh, on that money? There are, let's call trust monies and what we call controlled monies. Trust money is the money that sits in my trust account between the time it comes in and the time it goes out. Um, interest on trust monies is paid to the Legal Services Board and used to fund legal education and things like the Tenancy Board, those sorts of things. Tenancy unit. So that's, you know, it's it's um, it's uh, unlike England, the interest on trust accounts doesn't belong to the lawyer, doesn't belong to the client. It goes to the government or to a gov arm of the government. Um, if you were to, I don't know, let's say that you settle the sale of the property that your mum owned in. September, and you're making distributions in March, then what you might do is direct the estate solicitor to invest that money. And if the money was invested, the interest um, belongs to the estate. So that's called controlled monies as opposed to trust monies. Okay, thank you for that. Now, the second question is, one of the trustees owes the estate $100,000. Yes. And this uh, settlement has been delayed and we can't see why, except that maybe this $100,000 has not been paid back yet. Um, where do we stand on this and what pressure can we bring to bear, do you think? Uh, how many trustees? How many two, executives? Two, one solicitor and one relative. And have you asked the solicitor executor whether he or she proposes to take any enforcement action in relation to the debt? Uh, that has been indicated, yes. Indicated yes or indicated no? That's the answer is uh, negative. I, the answer is negative. negative. Uh, does, does the benefit obtained by that trustee um, exceed the amount the trustee receives under the will? Because um, quite often you exceed, would offset them. Hmm? It does exceed the amount of money that that trustee will receive from the will. Okay. Then one of the things that you might consider and I'm really worried about spending your money, yep. is an application to court to have that person removed on the basis that they're refusing to pay back to the estate what, what the debt is. Right, OK. Right, but then there might be a genuine dispute as to the 
either the existence of the debt or its amount. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, but that's your starting much. point. Yep. Thanks All right. And good luck with that. And Brighton, let's go to Villas. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning, John. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I own a couple of shops, and they're part of a, an apartment development that was built on a, a church grounds, and the church is a heritage church. And one of the body corporate laws is that my tenants, uh, my retail tenants, can't install a sign without permission from the body corporate. And that's quite logical because it's inevitable that the exterior of the building will be common property and not part of the tenancy, not part of what you own. Um, I don't know. It's a standalone building on the church grounds. So what... I think I think I know the building you're talking about, but okay. but what I would suggest is that you get a copy of the strata plan, or the yes. plan of subdivision, yes. and it will show you the dimensions and like loca- it will show you who owns what of the external wall. Okay. The other thing that you need to look at is the owners' corporation rules, yes. and see what they say about signage. Well, my my concern is if the committee didn't want uh, that particular tenant in my shop. Yes. Um, it, it seems that they're, they're being difficult. I, how could I get the rule changed so that council and their expert heritage advisors um, get final say over what sign is you appropriate? You need 75% yes. of the unit holders in, in unit entitlement to vote in favour of your change. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then there's no legal avenue that I can take? Uh, it is possible to issue Supreme Court proceedings to force, and, but, but you're not going to get... I wouldn't waste the money. Okay. I can't see the basis upon which you would argue that um, this is an unreasonable interference with the rights I acquired when I bought the property. So what? get a copy of the plan... Yes. Look at the look at the rules that have been created for the owners' corporation, mm-hmm. and work out exactly what your rights are before you start the next round of negotiations. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, where you ask, they refused. Yes. Um, you know, it's a lovely line, but people never change their mind. They they make yes. a new decision based on new information. Right. So um, you need to be well informed before your next discussion. All righty, Thanks. Thanks. All right, thank you. Good Thanks, on you. Guys. I've got so many text messages about junk mail, David. Yes. Including countless people saying, I've got a no junk mail sticker and I still get junk mail. But someone has sent me detailed information here. Junk mail is covered in the Victorian Environment Protection Act 1970, Part 7A, 45M, sub clause 2. Wow. It's illegal to deposit it if you have a sign. The problem is getting the EPA or council to find the offenders. It's from Karen in Flemington, who goes on with a very long um, dissertation about it all uh, and proposing all sorts of suggestions, some of which we might follow up. The difficulty, John, would be, let's say it costs the, the council or the EPA thousand dollars in terms of time and labour to f- follow it through. The maximum penalty is 10 penalty units. How much is a penalty unit now? Uh, 1200 bucks. Oh, sorry, 100 and, $120. $120. Bucks. So it's a $1,200 penalty, but it would cost multiples of that to prosecute. Well, you can you could ask for costs as well, but at the end, at the end of each transaction, the, um, uh, the council's going to be out of pocket. What's the point? Yep. Why make people hate me? Xavier in Camperdown. Morning, Xavier. Morning, John um, and David. Um, just got a question. Um, I booked uh, some accommodation um, online. Uh, am I allowed to say the name of the uh, company? Or do oh, let's not. Let's not yeah. for the moment. Yep. Yeah, I booked, booked some accommodation um, and then the owner of the property uh, d- declined and said, oh, and there's been a booking, it's double book. So anyway, the company in question took the money out um, and then obviously I noticed that and so I contacted them um, with regards to the fact that, you know, the money being taken out. And their response is that even though I've paid them, that they can't refund me until they make contact with the owner and they're saying the owner's not responding, so therefore they can't pay me back. I did... Doesn't, I uh, uh, Xavier, I would have thought that the accommodation would have been rejected via the same site it was booked in. It was. 
So they've already received communication from the owner saying that the accommodation's not available? Yes. Dispute the transaction with the credit card company. Okay, great. And, and say that it was cancelled and they won't give me a refund, so I want my money back, please. Right. On. And so just, you know, add again. to their paperwork burden, as they've done yes. to yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's great, because I've called a few times and they keep hanging up on me and they, yeah, <laughs> make you like... Uh, you, you can't be nearly as nice as you appear today, then, Xavier. <laughs> um, look, I, I try to be, but um, I have got a little bit agitated uh, when talking to them uh, for the sort of fourth and fifth time and, and whatnot, so, uh, yeah. Yep. No worries. Thanks very much. Good on you and thank you. Kevin in Rosebud, 26 past 10. Morning to you, Kevin. Yeah, morning, guys. Um, I rang you guys probably a couple of years ago now and I was advised to go to VCAT regarding the problem, which I did do, and we had a uh, ruling in our favour for around $20,000 for some work that we paid for that wasn't delivered. Uh, To cut a long story short, the fellow continues to make promises about paying us back and it's never been, uh, nothing's ever materialised. Is, is your, Kevin, is, is your claim against an individual or a company? It was a, a sole trader. All right. Do you know where he lives? Uh, that was the problem. He kept moving around, and we have found him from time to time, and he continues to promise to pay, but nothing ever comes from it. Um, the He's closed down the business. Yes, uh, yes. Um, I've been to the magistrate's court and it appears that there's a, a few different options of which way we could go, but all of them seem to depend on being able to locate him and determine whether he has any assets. Um, Ke- Kevin, one... uh, I've I real sympathy for you. You've got an order that says give me back $20,000, um, but you've got no satisfaction because it sounds like this person is a man of straw. Correct. So you could, um, uh, if you knew where he lived, you could do a title search and see if he owned it, and you might. Uh, Yep, I have. I've done title searches. Uh, It doesn't seem to be that he owns anything. Uh, Have you done a company search to see if he's got interest in a company that might own something? Uh, I have done some of that. It's not complete, but I'm not hot on my breath. So the question, the, the main question I have is that. I've been able to determine that he's done a similar thing to people in the past where one of the ways of paying us, he said he would pay us, was via a cheque. Yep. And the cheque bounced. Yep. There are people Uh, who go out of their way to contrive methods to rip people off and not be held accountable, Kevin. And anyone who's ever done any debt collecting, David, has encountered some of these individuals from time to time. More than one, John. Yeah. And they, if they're any good at it, you can actually go to extreme lengths, you can make yourself almost immune. Yes. But hey, you the, could the, bankrupt him, but I don't want you to spend the money. No. There's, the, a, the question, there's a thing called the Judgment Debt Recovery Act, which enables yeah. you to... Uh, he A subpoena is served on him requiring him to attend before court to give information as to his assets and his income. You're entitled to attend that appointment and as a general proposition, can also ask some questions. The summons for oral examination, examination. was always a favourite, Kevin, yeah. where they're compelled to come in and bear their soul to a judicial registrar, which many people find excruciating, and sometimes they pay up to avoid it. But the, the, main, the, the main question I had, if, if, if it's, is it illegal for him to have given me the false cheque? Is it, a, is it a legal... It is an offence under the Instruments Act to draw a cheque in circumstances where you know there aren't funds to meet it or it's not going to be paid. And the penalty would be? Uh, well, it's a, it's a crime, but it doesn't help uh, to Kevin. Get, you have to get the police to prosecute. Your police will, will want to prosecute. To do. You'll need to get them to prosecute and they'll come along, you know, might say, well, it's really a civil, civil matter, dispute. so, you know... That's, yep. the, that's your difficulty. You know, if it was a $10 million cheque, you, you would expect that there would be some interest. But I, I've got to say, you know, it's for even a $20,000 cheque, I'd say you know, probably not. Kevin, when I was an article clerk in 1980 or 81, I can't even remember now, David, but uh, I was working for a man who was the honorary solicitor unpaid for one of Melbourne's elite private schools. And needless to say, amongst the many, many families attending, there was always, there were always a few who didn't want to pay their fees. Yes. 
and we issued proceedings against a well-known Melbourne celebrity whose children for several years had attended the school without any money exchanging between the family and the school. And uh, at various points of time, this person who was regularly in the social pages of the newspapers and living a very flamboyant lifestyle um, was quite bluntly saying, I don't have any money. Uh, and eventually, sadly, his children were told to leave the school, mm -hmm. even though our debt collecting the efforts... Was withdrawn. Yes, and our debt collecting efforts were endlessly frustrated. And this person had gone to great lengths to make sure they had absolutely no assets in their own name. Kevin, uh, can I... Um, have you considered whether they, you might like to invest in some publicity? You could put an ad in the local paper that you've had a judgment against X who trades as Y for whatever period of time it is and he won't pay, but he's still, being, still in business. So if you're doing business with, with him, be really careful. So, I mean, you've got to make sure you don't breach the defamation laws. About which you should get appropriate advice, no, Kevin. And, although it sounds to me as the person's reputation may not be worth a great deal at the end of the day. Um, it's, it's really a question of you've got to work out what's a trigger that will force this person to pay when he doesn't want to. All righty. Thank you very much. Thank I'm, you. I'm now having flashback memories of standing in underground car parks, standing behind pillars, waiting for said celebrity to park their car so I could jump out from behind the pillar and serve them with this is the, documents, David. This is the way that uh, article clerks made more money, John. <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't getting paid anything. I was being made to do it on behalf of the firm. It wasn't okay. as an extra. I oh, know there I were people who extra, used to. John. There were people who acted as process servers for some extra cash. No, this was just um, your job when everyone else has failed is to make sure this gets served on said person. Okay. Who I might say I think is still around actually. Let's not go to take this any further, John. One of us might slip up. <laughs> right. I'll turn the microphone off during the news headlines. That's all there's time for with David Whiting today. 1300 222774 is the number for the open line which is coming up and David will be back at the same time next week.